speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. I stay in the garden with him, though the night around me bids me go through the voice of woe his voice to me is calling and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Amen, amen. Aren't you glad he walks with you and he talks with you? Well, if you remain standing and have your Bible open to Matthew chapter 23, Matthew chapter 23 uh, this evening, we're continuing to look at this week that we call the Passion Week, the week prior to uh, the crucifixion and then the resurrection of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're looking through uh, especially uh, certain events and the teachings of the Lord Jesus during this time, heading up to uh, our Easter uh, celebration this year here at Grace Baptist Church. And so we're looking at Matthew chapter 23. I want to read for our text this evening from verse 1 down through verse number uh, 13. We're going to be looking at, the, at this thought, uh, woe to the Pharisees. Uh, this is what Jesus uh, uh, did. Uh, he spoke very different woes, we can call them, to the Pharisees in this chapter. And so beginning with verse 1, it says, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe that observe and do, but do not ye after their works. For they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at feast and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be not ye called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you for the reading of the word of God this evening. And we pray now that you'd help us to learn from your word and by the preaching of your word, by the presence of your Holy Spirit, that you would draw us closer to yourself, that we can uh, learn, that we can be better equipped to serve you. And, and Lord, we would still pray as always for souls to be saved and lives to be changed and for revival to come. We'll thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. We're looking at this time still on the third day of the Passion Week. It would be on a Tuesday, and it's a great day of conflict. Uh, we've seen that already. There's much that takes place. Jesus actually gives uh, much teaching on this day. It's a day of conflict. Uh, the, the Pharisees, the scribes, the chief priests, and the elders, uh, we've already seen how they would question the Lord's authority. They would ask him, now, where do you get your authority? Jesus asked them, you tell me about John the Baptist. Where do you think he got his authority? They wouldn't answer him, so he said, well, I'm not going to answer you. And then, and then they went through other things. They questioned him. You remember we saw how that they questioned him, not because they wanted to learn something, but they questioned him uh, specifically trying to entrap him, trying to confuse him, trying to uh, catch him in saying something wrong. And, and so uh, we see this going on on this day. That's why we call it a day of conflict. But Jesus actually puts all of his enemies to silence uh, there in chapter 22. You'll notice the last verse of chapter 22, looking back where it simply says, and no man was able to answer him a word. They had no response back to him. They had no, I mean, and, and actually it says, and, and they would, uh, no one would ever ask him another question. And, uh, and so he just puts them all to silence. And now in chapter 23, he proceeds to openly expose them. Talking about the Pharisees and, and the scribes. You remember how in our study on the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus told his disciples that their righteousness would have to exceed uh, the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees in, in order to enter into heaven. That's back in Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 20 where he said, for I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. And if you remember in the uh, verse 48 of, of Matthew chapter five, he said, be ye therefore perfect, even as your father, which is in heaven is perfect. Now that word perfect means to be spiritually mature. And, uh, but these Pharisees, uh, we could safely say about them, they were not anywhere near perfect. They were not anywhere near uh, mature. Uh, Jesus exposes their hypocrisy, the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. He expounds the truth that the mere practice of religion uh, can never make a man holy. Uh, that the public exposure uh, that he gives here uh, no doubt would anger them angered these Pharisees very much and, and really probably uh, played a great part in their coming to that point of, of plotting and planning to crucify Jesus, to have him put to death. Uh, much of what Jesus says uh, to them and about them here in Matthew chapter 23 very likely was just adding fuel to the fire uh, for their hatred of him and their desire uh, to see him uh, crucified. And so in verse 1 down through verse number 12, in this chapter, Jesus explains this situation to his disciples and to the multitudes uh, around him. In verse 1, then spake Jesus to the multitudes and to his disciples. But then uh, from verse 13 and on down through verse number 36, he condemns the Pharisees. That's where you'll see over and over again, he pronounces woes upon the Pharisees. Verse 13, but woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And again in verse 14, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. He says it again in verse 15, again in verse 16, and, and, and continues uh, on through uh, the chapter. Verse number 23, woe unto you, scribes, and Pharisees, uh, hypocrites. And verse 25 as well, verse 27, all the way down through the chapter, Jesus pronounces these indictments against uh, the Pharisees. And so he's explaining this in the beginning of the chapter. He's explaining some things to his disciples uh, and to us. And, and, and there's two things to, to take note of. First of all, there'd be the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and you see that from verse 1 down through verse 7. Uh, 
And then he explains the humility of the disciples in verse 8 through verse 12. And so notice with me the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. He speaks to the multitudes and to his disciples. And then beginning in verse number 2, it says, uh, the, he, he says, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and they lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do, for to be seen of men, they make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues. Verse 7 says, And greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi. This has to do with their hypocrisy because uh, Jesus uh, pronounces these woes against them. But let's think about these Pharisees. Where do they come from? The Pharisees began in the time of Israel's history at a time when Israel was being pressured uh, by the Greeks uh, to forsake their laws and, and basically we could say to become liberal. Uh, one thing about the Greeks and uh, in, in, in the past, in history, they believed in a plurality of gods. You remember in the book of Acts when Paul the apostle was in Athens, Greece, and he went to that place called Mars Hill, and he talks about all of their devotions, which literally was talking about all of the idols that was in that place. They even had a, an idol or a devotion with, uh, that was marked to the unknown God. And so that's the way that they were. They believed in a plurality of gods, but Israel had one God. Now, to their credit, you could say that the Pharisees, uh, they sought to remain true to their faith and to protect the law and to separate themselves from the influence and the defilements of, of the heathen uh, world that had come upon them and that was around them. And, and they actually became interpreters of the law during a time when Israel had no prophets and Israel had no teaching uh, priest. And, and so if you've studied some about the history times of Israel, you know that there's a period of time that we refer to as the intertestamental period. And it's the time between the Old Testament and the end of the Old Testament scriptures and the beginning of the New Testament and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there's a period of 400 years there. There was no prophet uh, in Israel. There, there were no uh, teaching priests. The people were not being uh, instructed in the law of God at all. It was a time, there's wars that were going on and various things. Uh, it was a time at, that, that Alexander the Greek, the Greek had, uh, had basically took over the world. And that's why when we come to the New Testament, and in the Gospels, you find that the language of the world in that day was Greek. So that the New Testament was actually written in Greek. They spoke Greek uh, in, uh, uh, in Israel. And then you had the Romans that come along. And the Romans also believed in a plurality of gods. They believed in various gods while Israel had one God. The Romans weren't so much interested in the culture as the Greeks were, but the Romans were interested in government and to uh, invading the lands and, and setting up their own governments. And that's what they had done there in Israel when we come to the New Testament. And so you've got the influence of Greek culture and religion. You've got the influence of Roman uh, government and power there had been no prophet and no priest for some 400 years. And so really you have to give the, uh, this group of Pharisees a little bit of credit because they desired to uh, stay true to the law uh, of Israel, the law of Moses as they referred to it. And uh, they tried to stay separated from uh, the peoples and the things of the world. And, and so uh, they had become interpreters of the law when Israel had no prophets, no teaching priests. And in that sense then, they would sit in Moses' seat, uh, meaning that they had assumed the place of Moses as the leaders of the people. Uh, that's what these people ha had done. Uh, 
And so in verse 1 down through verse 3 again, uh, Jesus uh, speaks to the multitudes and the disciples. And he said the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. But he goes on and says, All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. And so here Jesus did not tell his disciples, now watch this carefully, he did not tell his disciples to observe or to follow or to do everything that the Pharisees taught, but only to uh, follow those teachings that were true to the law of Moses or to uh, the Old Testament scriptures. And, and you remember in much of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus rejects the teachings of the Pharisees. Much of those verses of scripture that we've already studied uh, here in our church, in our study in the Sermon on the Mount on Sunday mornings, uh, Jesus would say, you've heard it said of old, and, but he said, but I say this. And in all of those instances, he's not going against the law because he said that he did not come to destroy the law. He, he said he came to fulfill the law and the prophets. But what he's talking about is the Pharisees' interpretations of the law and their applications of the law and the burdens that they put upon the people in that day. Jesus said, you've heard them say it this way, but I'm telling you another way. Jesus really was getting them back to the true law of God and the, and the right interpretation uh, of it. And, and so uh, they, they were told you can follow their teaching when it was true to the scriptures. But don't do everything that they say or everything that they do. The great sin of the Pharisees was hypocrisy. And it was hypocrisy that was based on pride. You see that from verse 5 down through verse number 7. But all their works, this is what he says about them, all their works they do, they do for to be seen of men. Uh, they make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at feast and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the market uh, and to be called of men rabbi, uh, rabbi. They, their sin was hypocrisy. It was based upon pride, just plain old pride. Their religion was external and not internal. It was a major issue, a major problem uh, that was theirs over in Mark chapter number 7. Mark chapter 7 and just a couple of verses there. Uh, verse 5 down through verse number 7. It says, Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy, thy, thy uh, disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with bread, eat bread with unwashed hands? He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah, that is from Isaiah, he said, Well, well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. How be it in vain do they worship me? And here's the key. Teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. That's what the Pharisees were doing. And Isaiah had prophesied of this time and told that, uh, that this is the way that men were going to be doing, that they would honor God with their lips, but God would see in their heart and their heart was far from him. And so hypocrisy based on pride and an external outward show of religion, but they were not right with God in their heart, you see. They had nothing right on the, on the inside. And, and so their religion was external and not internal. Another problem that I think that they had was simply this. They, they never served anyone, but they always expected others to serve them. You notice how he described this back in verse number four, for they bind heavy burdens and grievous uh, to be born, lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. I think there's two ways you could look at what Jesus is teaching his disciples here in this verse. It could have been uh, actual physical burdens that they would get people to carry their stuff for them and, uh, and that sort of thing. And I believe that that would have been true. But also they would put burdens upon them as far as their interpretations of the law and the applications of it. As Jesus said, they would teach the, uh, uh, for doctrine the commandments of men. And so they would put burdens on the people that God never intended to be put upon them. 
And, and, and they, would, they would pressure them with these things. And, and the thing about it is, uh, again, in verse number 5, you'll notice, but all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. Uh, I believe I've mentioned to you their phylacteries uh, were these little uh, boxes that they would make, usually made out of leather or covered with leather. There'd be pieces of, of paper or parchment in there with Bible verses, Old Testament scripture written on it. They would bind these things around their arms, around their foreheads and uh, attach them to them all over. And, and the more they'd have, the more people would just want to look in awe what a, what a holy man or what a religious man this man was. They would wear their garments and, and, the, and the hem of their garments, they would have scripture portions from the Old Testament scriptures uh, embroidered on their garments and so when it says they they enlarge um, their uh, uh their their garments and the borders of their garments it was all to put on a show all to put on a show of how religious and how much uh they would make want people to think that these were people that loved the old testament law of god and, and religious people but you know the thing about it is uh, they really weren't any different than what the Apostle Paul describes over in 2 Timothy chapter number 3. And he tells Timothy, warns Timothy that people are going to be this way in the last days. When you read 2 Timothy chapter 3, I think you could say that there's some modern day Pharisees. Modern day Pharisees in the world even today. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affections, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And then he said this, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. That's a Pharisee. The Pharisee had the form of godliness but he had no power he had it all on the outside but it wasn't right on the on the inside and that was a great problem in this day when jesus was on the earth the problem of the hypocrisy of the pharisees and so jesus uh exposes them uh in his words here in matthew chapter 23 but then by contrast, he's teaching his disciples and he's exposing the hypocrisy of the Pharisees to his disciples and to the multitudes as well. And in verse 8 down through verse number 12, we can see uh, what Jesus teaches about the humility of the disciples. Notice the contrast. Humility contrasted with hypocrisy. But in verse 8, he says, But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be uh, exalted. And so the humility of the disciples, really in essence to sum all of this up, you could say that Jesus says to his disciples, don't be like the Pharisees. Just don't be like them. Uh, he talks about their hypocrisy. He, he exposes it. He reveals it in the following verses in the chapter. He pronounces these woes against them. And so he says to his disciples, you don't want to be like them. That's why he could say in the Sermon on the Mount that their righteousness would have to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. The righteousness of the Pharisees would have been simply an external, uh, we could say maybe a man-made or man-provided uh, righteousness uh, to make them appear to be righteous. But yet, we need to understand the only righteousness that's going to get you to heaven is the righteous, righteousness that you have inside. And it's the righteousness of Jesus Christ that has been imputed unto you by faith in Him. Amen. 
And so they were missing it really on all counts there. Jesus is saying right when he says to his disciples, don't be like them. Don't, don't be like those Pharisees. And in this contrast, when we see the humility of the disciples, we must see it in at least in two ways, I think, that he shows us in these verses. And, and his teaching that he gives is really important, not only for his disciples in that day, but for us in this day that we're living in right now, for our hearts to be right with God, for us to be not like the the. Pharisees and the hypocrisy uh, that they would have. For one thing, we need to realize and understand that greatness, and watch this, he tells them that greatness involves service. Greatness involves service. Verse number 11, but he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Greatness must involve service. Over in Matthew chapter number 20, Matthew chapter 20 and a few verses be, beginning with verse 25. Matthew chapter 20, verse 25, but Jesus called them, that is his disciples, called them unto him and said, ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. And then he uses his own self as an example when he says, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus is the example of, of humility. Jesus said that, that this is the way that we are to go. This is the way that we, are to, uh, that we are to follow. If we're to be great, we're going to have to be a minister. If we're to have greatness, we have to do service. And Jesus is the example of that over in Philippians chapter number 2. Philippians chapter 2, you remember this, of course, and beginning with verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, that's describing his incarnation and we understand that, but being found in fashion as a man, listen, it says he humbled himself. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You realize that on the cross of Calvary, I mean, sometimes maybe we don't think about it uh, as, as much as we should. But when you think about the Christ, when you think about Jesus being nailed to that cross and hanging on that cross, do we remember just exactly who he is He's the son of God. And he is that second person of the Trinity, of the Godhead. There is God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Ghost. Not three separate gods, but one God in three persons. That's the Holy Trinity. And as, that, as the second person, as the son of God, according to uh, John chapter number one, it was by the Son of God that everything was created. According to Paul's writing in Colossians, it was by Jesus and through Jesus that everything that was, was created. And not only that, but in the Gospels we read that, that God the Father has placed all judgment into the hands of Jesus, God the Son. Jesus is the Son of God. That Jesus is the creator of all things. And Jesus has the authority to be the judge of all things as well. And not only that, but by way of the incarnation, as we see in Philippians chapter 2, Jesus Christ in himself is God clothed in human flesh. He is the God-man. It's the God-man that's hanging on that cross. It's the God-man 
that is, that is shedding his blood. Uh, it is God that is sacrificing himself for your sins and for my sins. I'm not sure if we realize the significance of that uh, often enough. Greatness involves service. And, and Jesus, as God himself, is the greatest example of, of serving mankind when he gave himself to be the sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. And so humility involves, or greatness involves serv service. But also, uh, we see in Matthew 23 and verse number 12, that recognition requires humility. The Pharisees were always wanting to be recognized. That's why Jesus said that they loved this. He's back in verse number six, he said they loved the uppermost rooms at the feast. They loved the chief uh, seats in the, in the synagogues. They liked, to, they liked to have their place reserved in a place where they could sit, where, where everybody could take notice of them and see them. And in verse number seven, uh, they love to be called rabbi, rabbi. They love to have the salutations. They love for people to make much of them, you see. But Jesus tells us in verse number 12 that recognition actually requires humility. He says, and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. The teaching to his disciples is this. Look, if you, if you want to be known as someone uh, that would be great, then you need to be known as someone that will serve. And if you want to be recognized uh, as someone that, uh, that is recognizable or that is honored or that is good, then you're going to have to be someone that is humble. Those are the keys. Uh, that is the key to being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. We really need to realize this. Humility is the key to being a good disciple, to being a good follower of the Lord Jesus, to be able to one day hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I think humility is the key to it. Uh, he that is uh, greatest among you shall be your servant. Whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, but he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Remember what James writes in James chapter 4 and beginning with verse number 6. James chapter 4, verse 6. He said, but, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep and let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Humility is the key. Humility is the key to recognition for one day the Lord to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And, you, and, and, and service is the key to being recognized as someone great. But it takes humility to be a disciple, to be a good disciple. In 1 Peter chapter number 5 and verse number 6, Peter says, well, I'm going to read verse 5 with it. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. Clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. That's the instructions. That's the teaching that Jesus is giving to his disciples and to us. And he uses the Pharisees. He, he, he's teaching them truth about the problem with the Pharisees. He had already told them in the Sermon on the Mount, your righteousness is going to have to exceed theirs. Now it's as if he's saying, now here's why I said that to you. Here's why you need to realize it and understand it, that the Pharisees are but hypocrites. In all that they say and all that they do. 
And he says, don't be like them. Don't do like them. Instead, here's what you're going to need to do. To be great, you need to serve. To be recognized, you need to be humble. To humble ourselves under the hand of God. And then the results will be that God will lift us up and will exalt us. I want you to notice one other thing about the Pharisees. We'll continue with this, uh, the Lord willing, next time in our study, verse 13 and following some of the verses, some of these woes that Jesus pronounces on the Pharisees. But this one in verse number 13 that it begins with is really especially disturbing. Because he says, but woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye then that, that are entering to go in. You can understand this by saying that this woe is presented against them and this is a really a scathing accusation uh, that Jesus is making. And he's saying to them, said, look, there's, they were supposed to be the religious leaders. They were supposed to be the ones teaching men and women and children how to get to God, how to know God, how to get to heaven. And yet Jesus says about them, you're, instead of getting people to heaven, you're shutting heaven up away from them. You're closing the door. You're, you're keeping them out. He says, you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. And then he says, he says, for ye neither go in yourselves. Uh, 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 an indictment against their own spiritual condition. They're unsaved. They're lost. They're without God. And if, if, they, if something don't change and they trust God and trust Christ to be their savior, then, then they're, they're going to hell. He says, you're not even going yourself. And neither suffer ye them or, or you don't allow them to go to get to heaven, to get to God, that are, that are wanting to go, that are trying to get there. These are the ones that were recognized in Israel in this day as being the religious leaders, the rabbis, the teachers. They were the ones that were supposed to be showing the people the way to God. Instead, they were turning, uh, turning people away from God. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 12, verse 30. He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. You see, the thing about it is, if we're not careful to recognize uh, that we need this humility to be his disciples, then we dare not be like these Pharisees here. We need to realize that that, that we need to show people the way to heaven. And we need to not allow ourselves in any shape, in any form, in any fashion, be in such a condition that we actually keep people out. That we keep them out by the way that they see us living our lives. That we keep them out by the things that they hear us say. You know, the thing about it is, we are living in a day where there's still a lot of quote, uh, religious people that instead of leading people to heaven, leading people to God, they're turning them away. They're modern day Pharisees. Jesus says, dear friend, don't you be like that. Don't be like that. What do we need to be? We need to be real. You say amen? We need to be real. And the only way to be real is to know that you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. You've been born again, and your life has been changed from the inside out. The, what you have is something that's happened on the inside, not simply a religious tradition or practice on the outside. But you've got a change that's taken place on the inside. And that change on the inside shows up on the outside. And it doesn't show up in hypocrisy. It shows up in humility. And it shows up in service. And that's the way people can see that, that, uh, that, that, we've, that, we've, that we're real in our, in our 
discipleship and in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's keep it real. Amen. Amen? Keep it real. Don't be a Pharisee. That's what Jesus would say. But keep it real uh, this evening. Let's go ahead and stand together, church. Our heads bowed and our eyes closed for prayer. Lord, we do thank you for the Word of God. We thank you for this opportunity to study together once again uh, this evening. And Lord, we, we, we can see uh, the problem in that day with, in Israel of the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. Lord, help us not to ever in any fashion be like them in the way that it would keep people from coming to you. Lord, we want to be humble. And Lord, we want to be servants. And we want to be able to bring people to you and not to turn them away. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd help us. Help us to always be mindful that we must humble ourselves under your hand, that you would lift us up, and that you, in turn, could use us to be a blessing to others and to bring glory to you. And Lord, for that we would thank you and we would praise you. And it's in Jesus' name that we do humbly pray. Amen and amen. Let's sing another song together, church, as Brother Tim leads us. Page 284. <clears throat> Who at my door is standing, patiently drawing Entrance within demanding Who is the voice I hear? Sweetly the tones are falling Open the door for me If thou wilt hear 